I'm Dana Jeweler, and this is my coworker and close colleague, Jennifer Hernich. We'd like to welcome you to the fourth annual evening of Healing Stories of Strength. Looking at these familiar faces, it's hard to believe this is our fourth event. As you can imagine, this evening is frequently in our minds for the months and the days that lead up to it. And as we were rehearsing last week, it was the anniversary of my father's passing. It was the 45th anniversary. Every year I post a picture of him on Facebook and I think, wow, it's so cool to look like him. I have that remembrance. Jennifer, as I said, and I are close colleagues. As we were getting to know each other in the hospital cafeteria, we both work at the hospital. We were saying, oh yeah, we came from different cities. Me from Bethesda, she was from uh, Greensboro, yeah. North Carolina. I always want to say Charlotte. And we talked about our families and everything and we both realized we were both suicide loss survivors. We lost our fathers as children. I was eight and Jen was five. Since then, we've been on our path to resilience and strength ever since. We are both members of the Clinton County, New York Suicide Prevention Coalition and the Anti-Stigma Coalition, and they both have missions that are very close to our hearts. I'm really proud to be part of the Anti-Stigma Coalition recently and to look on Facebook and the internet at what Prince William and Harry and Kate are doing to eradicate the stigma. If you haven't had a chance to look, go online and, and look up Heads Together. They're really doing great work. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get rid of the stigma about nurturing our mental health and uh, just being strong and getting counseling? This evening will be truly inspirational. It may get heavy at times, and if you feel you need to speak to someone, there'll be counselors at the back of the room. Just make your way in the back. We'll have time to, for you to ask questions, and if you're sort of shy about asking in front of a big group, write it down, there are pens scattered throughout, and there are index cards, and a volunteer will read your question for you. This morning, as I scanned through Facebook, I discovered a quote by Marvin J. Ashton. If we could look into each other's hearts and understand the unique challenges each of us faces, I think we could treat each other more gently, with more love, patience, tolerance, and care. As you know, we all have fast-paced lives. We're all going in 10 different directions. So if I can do just a quick centering exercise to bring you into the present and the moment. So as I begin, sit comfortably, soften your gaze, or close your eyes. As you breathe deeply, take that cleansing air deep into your lungs and into your belly, and hold it for about the count of six. Visualize any stress, that hustle and bustle of your life, Anything that's nagging at you, just leaving your body with your exhalation. Another deep breath. Attach all those negative feelings. Anything you want to get, just expel for this hour and a half. Let it out. <coughs> One more deep cleansing breath. and exhale. That is my gift to you. So at this time, we would like to take a few moments to recognize our previous speakers for the past three years that have had the courage to get up and share their stories of survivorship with our community. This is an incredible group of survivors who have overcome a number of adversities some of which include the painful losses of a father, of a brother, of a son to suicide, a permanent spinal cord injury, homelessness, drug addiction, being transgender, being severely burned and in a coma, anxiety disorder and fear of public spaces, and autoimmune disease, living through the horrors of a war and being permanently separated from friends and family, devastating house fires, battles with both lung and breast cancers, growing up as a child of an alcoholic, being a parent in the midst of drug and alcohol addiction, and domestic and sexual abuse. So let's just take a moment to, to honor everyone who was our past speaker. So why am I here tonight? You're probably asking yourself that question right now, especially if this is your first time. And maybe you came to show support for a loved one. Maybe you suffer from depression and have difficulty getting through the day. 
Perhaps you've lost hope in the face of trauma and you just need to regain the health of your mind, body, and spirit. I can share with you the reason why I'm here. It's because I'm kind of screwed up. <laughs> but we all are a little, right? But I, I'm really here because I want to stand in my truth. Because it's people that stand in their truth that can actually change the world. I, as Dana said earlier, I lost my father to suicide when I was young. I had a pretty lousy replacement of a stepfather um, that I grew up with after that. And then I ended up running away at the age of 16. And it actually took me coming all the way up here to Plattsburgh to surround myself with such strong women like Dina and Carrie and Sally and Debbie and Dana and Bonnie um, to surround myself with these strong women to realize how important it is to love yourself first in order to give the love that other people need. So I'm here because I want to be connected with this source in the community, with that infinite wisdom that I know is in the room right now. So I'm here tonight because I want to listen and receive the answers that I've come here seeking. And I ask you right now to take just a minute and look at the person to your left and to your right and just ask each other, so why are you here tonight? <laughs> So no matter why you came, we're here to share a heartfelt message with you tonight from people who have absolutely weathered the storm and found a way to get through some of the most turbulent times by conquering their most painful emotions head on. So with that said, I would like to now introduce Sally Meisenheimer. She is a certified mediator, life coach, and someone who I am very proud to call my friend. She lost her mother to cancer and her brother to alcoholism. She is the only person that I know who has the gift of listening deeply to your soul and the uncanny ability to make you sob one minute and die laughing hysterically the next. <laughs> so tonight, she has the great responsibility of serving as the facilitator. Please welcome Sally Meisenheimer. exercise I think was meant for the first row here and when we looked at each other and said why are we here oh I'm speaking tonight I had no idea I couldn't laugh about that so we're all relaxed now um, I have come to realize that these talks these evenings of healing um, are, are the initiators of the talks we wish we could have and uh, you're here tonight to feel something, to learn something, and hopefully to take something home. I'm no stranger to loss and grief, as Jen said, but I am uh, a little far away from it at this time. Um, I've not forgotten, though, the depth and the width of what grief feels like, uh, and, and so I like to share those experiences. Uh, in my healing path, I've come to recognize two truths, and they're my kind of silly truths, but they work well for me. And the first one is a quote by John Bradford. It is uh, paraphrased from the New Testament, though, and I'm kind of a New Testament fan. Uh, and the quote is, there but for the grace of God go I. There but for the grace of God go I. And what that means to me is it recognizes that others, other people's misfortunes could be my own. Um, that I'm not immune to it and it maybe just isn't my turn to be suffering at that time. Um, none of us share the exact same traumas or tragedies, but we, we know that we'll all walk through those deep, dark valleys in our lifetime. It's, it's, uh, there's no guarantee to just have a happy, smooth life. Um, so healing from tough stuff, I think, brings a lot of humility 
And I think with that humility, it helps us acknowledge that it could be you, it could be me, it could be them, it's all of us. My second truth is that I have had to invite loneliness and sadness into my friend group. Uh, that I have to have those as something that I'm comfortable with. And I think that they're not the funnest of friends, but once I realize that those are emotions that I guess I can be with and be comfortable with, I, I was a lot less tired. And I think that coexisting with them it is easier than fighting them off. Uh, the other friend that I try to unfriend is self-pity. Um, I think we all need a little pity party every now and then, and I think that that's okay too. So lately I've been trying to do a lot more listening than I am talking. And uh, I have little scraps of paper. I, I know my friends see me writing these silly things down. I have scraps of paper in my pockets and uh, on my kitchen island and uh, on my dresser. I, I get up in the middle of the night and I write something down or I hear something and I think, I'm either going to think about that or I'm gonna share it with somebody. And so I've had a really good week uh, for good things that have been said to me that I've really thought about. I can't mention them all, but my little pieces of paper say three things this week. The first one was said by one of my good friends in this room, and she says to me, I go, oh, I feel all wacky, it's spring, and I think that I'm, I'm just not feeling quite right. And she said, well, the universe is on schedule. You might not be, but the universe is. And I thought, wow, I need to think about that. That's a good one. The next one was, this is a deep one, and I don't know if I agree or not, but it's something to think about. All anxiety stems from the fear of separation. All anxiety stems from the fear of separation. I see some people nodding. That's a, that's a tricky one to wrap your mind around. The best one I heard this week, though, that relates most to tonight is listen without judgment. What does that mean? Well, I will tell you what I think it means, that when we listen without judgment, we can better understand others, but we also can, more importantly, better understand ourselves. Listening without judgment is liberating. It frees us up to really enjoy people, to be in the moment, um, and also it, Sorry. It also makes us not assign emotion or uh, what other people should be feeling. It, it, it just lets us listen. Um, and I hope that maybe through listening tonight, you might uh, invite some new feelings and emotions into your friend group. Uh, take some time to really listen and without deciding how somebody should feel or what the cause was of of what happened to them or who to blame. It's just purely a listening exercise. I think it's a great idea uh, if you can write some things down as you're listening. We, do, we would like some questions, but even if you just write something down that you heard tonight that you'd like to comment about, we accept comments too. And I'm sure that our speakers will have something to say about your comments. So this grace that I spoke of earlier, is what has really given our speakers tonight strength, hope, resilience, courage, and a passion to share with you. And we hope that this passion will encourage you to go and share with others too. So we're gonna get started now. And I'd like to introduce Danielle. And my favorite thing about her is I just got to know her recently and what a, what a delight. Uh, but the best thing I know about her is when she's walking around her acupuncture studio, she hums. And I think that that humming is really her expression of joy. And it is just really a, a comforting, beautiful thing. It's free. And to me, that, that's a testament of your strength and acceptance, Danielle, that you can just hum when you're in between patients. Um, although her trauma is not easy to talk about, and it's not easy to hear, uh, she shares her story to open up conversations and to put power back into uh, victims. So welcome, Danielle. She asked for it. <laughs> no, really, she asked for it. Did you see what she was wearing? 
men just get this urge to rape. They just do, and that's what it is. So we should all accept it. These are just some of the misconceptions about rape and sexual assault. And I was raped when I was 21 years old, and that was seven years ago. And you know, it's very confusing. It's a confusing thing, trauma, just trauma in general, because we talk about some of it and we talk about others, and sexual trauma is really hard to talk about in general. And you know, what we talk about is the response to trauma, and that is either fight or flight. So either we're gonna fight them off, fight our attacker off, or we're gonna run away, or maybe in a certain combination. And so what we don't talk about with rape and sexual assault is freeze. So this is an actual biological thing that can happen in the brain where some, this is happening to us and our brain really just sort of goes offline. And so it's a pause while the event is occurring. And that happened to me. And so I was raised by really strong parents, strong, strong women around me. And what did that say about me? That I just froze and I let this man rape me. And not only that, but I dissociated. And so that means that, you know, I actually left my body and I watched from above one of my good friends rape and choke me. And so for me, it went freeze. And in that time, time and space doesn't even exist. So you don't really know how long it happened or anything. So it went freeze, fight, flight. So when I was able to come back to my body, I pushed him off. I, I, I pushed him off and I ran. And I quite frankly ran for my life and he chased me. And so I beat myself up over this freeze, 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 freeze. Why didn't I do anything? Why didn't I fight? And so I realize now that freeze could have potentially saved my life. What happened if I would have fought back? What would have happened? Would he have choked me out? Could I be dead right now? And so I made it to the car and I locked the doors and I was naked. And so I quickly put on my clothes and I started sort of circling downtown Plattsburgh. Like, where do I go? What do I do? This happened to me. And I realized that I couldn't go home and I couldn't face my family. And so where I ended up was my now husband's apartment. So he's my boyfriend at the time. Which is confusing because I'm dating somebody and this happens to me. And so I run up the stairs and I burst through the door. And he said to me later, I thought somebody died. And I said, didn't they? Didn't they? And so from there, I had to go to the OBGYN. I had just gone for my annual, and so I had to make an emergency appointment because I didn't know if I had an STD. And so I went in, and I didn't see my regular provi provider, like I said, and she said, well, why are you here? And I said, I was raped two days ago, and I would really like to be checked to see if I have an STD. And the first thing that she said to me was, well, what were you wearing? And I was dumbfounded. I mean, I was legitimately dumbfounded. I don't care if I was wearing nipple tassels and crotchless panties. No means no. And so I think I actually answered her. I was like, a tank top and jeans? And then her next question, well, was there alcohol involved? And so I had already blamed myself. I had already gone through it in my head over and over again. I froze, I froze. Why did I let him do it to me? And here's this healthcare provider, somebody that I should be feeling safe with in a safe space, basically blaming me. And so that, it was just like re-traumatization, basically. And so from that point on, I thought what anyone should do, well, I thought for me, I should just, I should just distance myself from this. And so when I did make it home, 
I thought, so my mother, very strong woman, state trooper for 25 years, Amazon woman, somebody I look up to greatly, I thought that by telling her that I would immediately just be rushed to the police barracks. You're gonna tell, you're gonna tell, we're gonna get it. And she gave me probably one of the biggest and most amazing gifts my whole life. She said, your power was taken away from you once and I'm not gonna do it again. So you're gonna decide what you wanna do. And so I did, I decided that I wanted to move on. I decided that distancing myself from the event would be the best thing for me. And so I did that. I did that with alcohol. I did that with drugs. I did that with any way that I could escape my body. Because I thought that moving towards the trauma was going to throw me off the deep end. I mean, I just didn't think that I could handle it. And so I would continue to get repeated contacts. The man who rapes me just keeps trying to contact me over and over again. And every time it happened, it would spin me, completely spin me. And so I was in grad school at the time, and I realized that what I was doing wasn't working. It just wouldn't work to just pretend like it didn't happen, pretend like you're okay. And so I started working, really working working towards moving closer to it, moving closer to my body, trying to understand what my thoughts, feelings, and emotions are on the subject, and how, how can I get closer to move through it, feel to heal. And so that's essentially what I did. And I really, I mean work, lots of work, and it's still work. And so now I've graduated. I started my acupuncture practice. And it's a gift that my practice is very busy. And I'm so grateful to do what I do every day. And what I can do is I can change the way that I relate to the trauma. And so what that means is using it for good. It means creating safe space. And when somebody comes into me and says to me, I was raped two days ago, I don't blame them. And so it's a gift. It really is a gift. And, you know, when I was raped, my soul shattered. That's what it felt like. It felt like my soul shattered and I've been on walking this path and doing the work and trying to put all the pieces back together. And I, I promise that the before picture and the mosaic picture that I'm putting together is just stronger. It's woven together in steel, but it's softer, it's wiser, it knows, it's intuitive. And so for that, I truly am eternally grateful for what happened to me. And that's confusing. It's confusing to say to somebody who's walking through it right now, to say, one day you're gonna be grateful. But it's true. So anyone who's going through a trauma like this, I just encourage you, any trauma really, I encourage you to zoom out. Don't miss the forest through the trees. Try to move closer to it. Because I found that by moving closer to myself, it's opened a wealth of information that I can use in everyday life. And so I just want to leave you with a, one of my favorite quotes from Mark Twain. And that is, the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. Thank you. she moved closer to it and what what a, what an encouraging uh, remark for people that are on the right on the raw edge of trauma trauma to, to to become friends with it and to move through it thank you Danielle so Trevor is uh, among the first people that called me after my brother died and my brother was 35 years old and he called me to truly just acknowledge my sadness 
and to show his understanding of the hopelessness that my brother felt from his alcoholism. Trevor was close to that himself and could really relate to it. And you know what, he didn't say much, but it was one of the most powerful phone calls that I ever received. And what I learned is that true compassion doesn't need a whole lot of words. It, it can be really just being with somebody and just calling somebody and you don't know what to say, but you're in there with them. And uh, I think that w once you listen to Trevor, you'll understand uh, the effect he had on me and also the effect he has on our community and the people that he is in contact. And I know they heal him as much as he heals them. So welcome, Trevor. Thank you, Sally. And thank you for the people who put this on. It's a very, uh, very inspiring and important uh, event in a, in a community such as ours. Um, Danielle, I thought did a, did a superior job, and, and I salute you for taking, uh, taking a public stand about something that is so difficult to speak about. And, and I think that's a remarkable thing. And you know, I, I wasn't going to go this direction, but I want to, I want to pick up a, a thread and pull a little bit that, uh, on something that, that Danielle said. Am I holding this at the right distance? Can you guys? Keep it close. Um, Danielle said that she was ultimately, that she was ultimately uh, grateful for what had happened to her. And uh, that does sound weird. It sounds strange. Well, how on earth could someone feel grateful for having had a trauma in their life? And I'd like, to, I'd like to address that a little bit as it, as it pertains to me. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I haven't had a drink in a long time. Uh, thank you. Uh, and in, in the fellowship that I belong to, uh, in the 12-step program that I, that I still attend regularly, you hear a lot of people talk about being a grateful alcoholic. And most of us who come into the program don't get that at first. We, we do exactly what many of you probably in here did when, when we heard Danielle say that, they go, how can you be grateful to be an alcoholic? And it doesn't make sense until, it didn't make sense for me until I recognized that if I hadn't been through what I'd been through, I wouldn't be where I am. And that's a, that's a, a, a realization that I know, I know myself, and I know that if I hadn't been through, if I hadn't been, as we describe sometimes, beaten into reasonableness, that I never would have been able to, to step back, to zone out, or zoom out, as, as Danielle used, I think that's a great phrase, and be able to look at and appreciate what I've been given. And what I've been given is an opportunity, in fact, the, the, a, a, com a compelling reason to stop and look at myself, see where I've been, and see where I can go. Um, anyway, I'm going to back up. Uh, it, for those of you who don't know kind of the, the run-up to why I, I am here now, uh, it is because I am an alcoholic and I started drinking at a, at a very young age. And I had, you know, all sorts of tiny little traumas leading up to leading up to a fairly major one. Uh, Bonnie Black is going to later speak about connecting the dots. And I describe my, my existence uh, prior, to, prior to getting sober and, and changing the way I'm living as a whole series of dots. I, and I could see all the dots. You know, it's, it was it's quite something to me when I look back now and, and see all these dots and recognize my utter inability to connect them. You know, there are all sorts of data points, but no patterns. When I looked at when I looked at my life, until I got to the point where I was really truly driven to my knees, and helped, urged, cajoled, uh, nurtured, nudged to address what's what had been going on in my life, own what was mine, 
make things make things right with, with the people who had, had tolerated my behavior. Goodness knows why. Most of them did it. Um, and put it behind me. And put it behind me. And it, was, it'd be, it would be impossible for me to do that alone. And I still can't do it alone. I need, I need the help of, of people who have had similar experiences and people who have the willingness to stick with me, to explain how what, what has gone on in their lives is similar to mine, and not to tell me what to do. I don't know about anybody else in here, but when I get told what to do, I react very poorly. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, it's, you know, when you tell me what to do, I can almost guarantee you that, that, our, that the next few minutes of our, of our encounter, is, is that correct, J.D.? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when you tell me what to do, the next few minutes of our encounter are not, they're not going to be very pleasant. Uh, you know, because I, I, I'm, uh, I'm arrogant, and I know it all, and I'm, you know, all sorts of, all sorts of ugly things. But I have, but I have, stop laughing, guys. <laughs> but I have understood, and I have come to appreciate, that when you show me what you had done, to get through the same or a similar situation, I'm much more willing to follow. And when I'm willing to follow, when I'm willing to follow the paths of people before me who have gone through similar things, it's, it, it, gives me, it gives me an entire different and new outlook on life. I live a really good life. I live a really, really good life. We have one car. It has almost a quarter million miles on it. I'm dedicated to the proposition of driving it until it has 300,000 on it, and then I'll think about getting rid of it. <clears throat> but you know what I have today? I have... I have people who love me, and I have many, many, many people whom I love. And I have the ability and the willingness to show that love for people. I also have today the recognition of the fact that I can't do this. I can't, I don't know how. I don't know how to live a good life. I have to be shown on a daily basis. I have, to, I have to allow people to lead me. And I have to recognize that I have to recognize that that no human power could have relieved me of the misery that I was living in. I have to recognize that I need that I need a power greater than myself. I need a power greater than anything on this earth, anything that I can get my mind around uh, in order to live a decent life. If I if I could give you something of me to take away today, uh, I think the most I hope this has some value. It's it's the it's the commonality of experience. You know, I was I was the great I am. The world revolved around me when I was when I was before I got sober. I was it. Everything happened around me. Anything that was good was given was, was something that, that I had earned. Everything that was bad that happened to me. Was, what's, was, was a result of somebody doing something to me. I was unable to recognize the fact that, that I'm not a self-made person. I love, uh, what's, what's, uh, what's the now, I think he's a congressman, maybe a senator from New Jersey, uh, he used to be the mayor of Newark, and Booker, Booker, Cory Booker? Cory Booker. Have I got that right? <coughs> I loved, I loved, uh, 
a quote that I heard him or I read him give one time. He was talking about how his father pulled him up short when he was a kid. His father said, kid, stop walking around like you hit a home run. He says, you were born on third base. <laughs> and you know, I have to recognize that. Uh, my mother said, or I shouldn't go back that far. I, I've had somebody say to me that um, the problem with a self-made man is that he comes to worship his creator. And, you know, that was me. But it is so, it's, it's so wrong. It's so, it's so, uh, it's just, it's just wrong for me to think that way. I ended up 13 years, four months, and two and a half weeks ago in a hotel room with two half gallons of vodka and a pistol. And, uh, and I put the pistol to my head, cocked it, and pulled the trigger, and it didn't go off. And, you know, I have, I'm grateful that that happened. I'm grateful that that happened. Because if I hadn't been through an experience like that, I would, not have, I would not have been in a position to recognize that, that I'm here for some reason other than what, what I thought. I, I'm, here for, I'm here to be helpful to other people. Uh, and the way I do that is, is by doing my best to help other alcoholics and, and hopefully, hopefully letting people see what I see today, which is that we're much more alike than we are than we are different, and that if I'm there to help other people, I get better. I really, really live a good life today because I do my best to give away what has been so freely given to me, and I, I think I can leave that uh, there this evening. I'm very, very grateful to have been here. Thank you for waiting. Sweet to see you. to connect the dots, like you had said, Trevor. It's, you know, sometimes it's in plain sight for other people, but it takes a while for us to recognize what's happening to us. So Brittany has a timeless manner. I just met her recently. A steady gaze, a really kind demeanor. And she disproves the theory that youth and wisdom cannot coexist. They certainly have for her. She had a tremendous loss at a very young age and has experienced grief in a number of different ways as she's grown into adulthood. And offering comfort to other people has just been part of her healing process led by her parents uh, from the start. So let's listen to her story. <laughs> from a very close, come from a very close-knit family. Um, we were very fortunate to grow up a quarter of a mile from aunts, uncles, cousins, and all of my grandparents. Um, and that gave us a very strong sense of a unified extended family. Um, I went to grade school with the same 20 kids all through grade school and often played sports with many of them, soccer, hockey, baseball, um, and that gave us a strong sense of uh, community. Um, we frequently had friends over to play, but we always had teammates with our siblings. Um, my brother Matt is 14 months younger than me, and my brother Scott is five years younger than me. Um, we, Scott was the baby of our family. He completed our family in every sense of the term. Um, we, Matt and I both formed a very different but very strong bond with him. Um, that was individual and joint. Um, 
the day of February 1st, 1997, started off like any typical winter Saturday. We played outside, went sledding, shoveled my grandmother's driveway, and then we went um, to a hockey tournament. My dad coached Scott's team to the victory, and we went home. My mom and I went home, started making dinner, and the boys were supposed to follow close behind us. Um, we were almost home, and we heard the sirens, and my mom said she knew. Just in her heart, she knew it was the boys. Um, our, uh, my mom's best friend and neighbor, and our very good close friend, who was also a trooper, came to our door. And I remember my mom, I was 12, I remember my mom saying, no, no, don't let them in, no, no. So finally, once we let them in, they said, the boys were in an accident, Scott didn't make it. And at the very naive age of 12, I remember saying to my mother, don't worry, the doctors will fix him, because that's, kids don't die. Like, I, we'd never experienced loss before, and that's, I thought 100% they would fix him. Um, then my brother Matt was very badly injured. He was in traction in the hospital for six weeks, and when he finally came home, he was in a cast, half his body, and relied on people for everything. Um, the four of us in our household had very different grief journeys. My dad felt a strong guilt um, and at the same time, he felt like he was the man of the house. He had to keep us together. He had to be strong for the rest of his family. My mom had just lost her child. Um, she, but yet, she still had two others. She had to get out, take care of our household, get me to school, go visit my brother who was in the hospital, and just keep life normal. Matt was immobile, helpless for months and months. And I, to be honest, often felt left out. Um, I went to school like normal, but I felt like my grief did not matter. Everyone asked how my parents were. Um, even my friends, I went back to school a week, maybe two weeks later, and it was kind of like nothing happened. Um, we, as a family, we put all of our energy into making something better out of this. And we worked tirelessly with the amazing support of our generous community and helped take what we now call the Scotts Memorial Rink from an outdoor little rinky, rinky dink ice rink to an amazing, fully enclosed, high functioning rink that it is today. Um, we always call it a labor of love. I, I pretend my mom came up with that term. Um, it really has been a labor of love. Um, we always, as a family, we felt closer to him when we were there working tirelessly year after year. Um, and, you know, it's really helped us work through the grief. And being a hockey family, we thought that was, that was what we were meant to do to honor Scott. Um, we also found the Compassionate Friends. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that. It's a support group, national, well, actually worldwide, um, that helps parents, grandparents, siblings get through the loss of a loved one. Um, my mom and dad and I went to a meeting, and we became members at first, and then my mom and I became leaders because we really felt like we could make a difference and help people and support people. Um, the Compassionate Friends really helped me because I met people that had similar situations. No, no trauma is the same, but it felt good knowing other people had been through the same thing. Um, I didn't have that, I was 12. No one in my school had gone through that, um, and that's mainly where I had my friends. Um, and I went to four different counselors, and I finally found one, and I'd probably still be going to him if he was still here. Um, but the Compassionate Friends was different um, just because I wasn't paying them to go talk to them. Um, my mom always says, you know, when people say, like, you know, can I, do we pay to come to these meetings? Do we do this? And she always says, we paid the ultimate price. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how we feel, that we can give back. Um, we're not experts by any means, like the counselors, but we just, we listen, we share, we try to help people.
people along their grief journey. Um, I strongly dislike the phrase, it gets easier. I know you've all heard it. I do not agree with that at all. Um, I always say grief changes, it gets different. It does not get easier. Um, it's been 20 years and it has gotten much harder for me than it was 20 years ago. <coughs> Um, for me, grief hits in waves, and those waves for me are the major milestones. Um, my brother's graduation, when I got married, when I started having children, when his friends started getting married and having children, which I don't know how that's possible. Um, it, I mourn at every milestone. I mourn that I, he wasn't in my wedding. He didn't come to the hospital to see my children. I mourn all of those milestones. And so that's why I say it does not get easier. It, it changes and you can you cope with it. It's just, it's not easier. Um, and then when I became a parent myself, I grieved in a whole different way. I grieved for my parents because I never knew what they were going through until I had my own child. And then my heart broke all over again. And I grieved for my brother in a completely different way. Um, and I, I finally understood what it was like to bring a life into this world and to nurture it and teach it and love it so unconditionally that, I mean, I told my mom, I mean, I've only been a mom for three years, but I said, I don't know how you got out of bed. And she always says, I did not have a choice. I had other children, I had a husband, I had a house. I didn't have a choice. I think you did, but <laughs> but you chose to do that. Um, I I, very, I do feel fortunate, um, and I know, like we said, it sounds silly, um, but we as a family have used this tragedy to become closer to one another, and I I don't know what it would be like if if we didn't have this trauma. Um, but I just know that we are extremely close, and I'm very fortunate for that. Um, we, I feel like grief has allowed me to not take anything for granted and to not hold back at all. And we know tomorrow is not promised, and so we live today, and we make the mess, most of it. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. I think most importantly, what you said is it doesn't get easier, it does get different. And that's kind of those friends that we have to invite in to, to be with. Um, well, lastly, I'd like to introduce the lady that lurks in the shadows here. <laughs> she promised me she would come out. Um, and I, I'll tell you what she does, and then I'll tell you what she means to me. And. Uh, Bonnie Black is the suicide prevention and intervention. She's a trained trainer. So she helps people, workers, employees, everyone learn how to deal with suicide um, from a prevention and an intervention uh, way. She's the coordinator of the Clinton County Postvention Response Team. If you read the Press Republican, it's been mentioned a lot lately, which is a really uh, wonderful thing to have in our community. And Bonnie, I go way back with Bonnie. Our daughters dance together with, uh, in ballet. And uh, I think what I admire most about her is that she has a wonderful balance between practicality and compassion. And uh, she's, she just, she knows what to do, but she does it with her heart as well. So welcome, Bonnie. So I'm pleased to be here because um, for the first three years, I lurked in the shadows totally. I, I do audio, I do that at church, I do it in theater. Um, tech is where I'm most comfortable when I'm out in public. But I'm not shy on stage either. So. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was asked to connect the dots, I said, of course. 
Each year's been very interesting. Our dots are in different locations. As you mentioned before, they're not always in focus. We don't know exactly what they mean, but upon reflection, we see some things. We heard tonight that trauma can be soul shattering. I think each one of us that has gone through trauma regardless what type, our souls have resonated and have shattered. And when we get to the point of understanding that our souls have shattered is when we realize what was also mentioned tonight, we can't do it alone. It is not something we can do alone, which is a great thing to look at from a mental health perspective, which is where I professionally come from. We are social animals as human beings. We need each other. And it's at the moment that we reach out that we truly begin the healing process itself. One of the other statements made tonight was something I can't read, but another one was... <laughs> I have the back of a post-it note, the back I'm writing on, so it says big, a lot, big, 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 Can't read that one. But another statement was, be willing to follow. We don't know it all. We can't do it by ourselves, and we need to be willing to follow. Follow those who have gone in our footsteps before. We have many traumatic situations with which Jen summarized at the beginning of tonight. The various traumas that our neighbors, that our friends have gone through and have had the courage to stand up and say, this is me. This is the raw me. This is the soul that's been shattered. But I need you to help me. I've been part of the Clinton County Coalition to Prevent Suicide since the day we began. In 2000, oh, sorry about that. In 2006. And it was really as a reaction to a friend's loss of her son. <coughs> and when we say we don't know what the future is going to bring, or to say, you know, I'm grateful. I can't say that. But I appreciate how the community came together, how the community linked with each other, how through our ups and downs in our coalition, we have members that come, we have members that go. We are here when you need to follow from your soul-shattering experience. Our convener, Amanda Boris, is here. Um, under her direction, we have grown in the ability that we've been able to do suicide prevention training, suicide intervention training. So those trainings are listed on a handout um, in the back by the water. Um, and we really, the beginning of this month, April 1st, and it wasn't a Fool's Day joke, our suicide postvention team launched. And why? because the spring into the summer is when the most suicides occur. Opposed to the myth that you may think about the holidays. There are many reasons. Suicide is multifactorial. It's not just one thing. But we join together, we join as a group. And as we go through, whether it be suicide or other trauma, what we need to recognize is that if we have a caring and compassionate community, which should be our goal. That we will be a stronger community. We will be there ready to support each other. We will be available to help put that mosaic back together so that when it is shattered, we are stronger by what binds us together. And we hope that each of us and all of us will have the strength, which you've heard tonight, which you've heard 
for four years now, regardless of trial, that we, each one of us, can connect those dots and say, here's my hand. Let me lift you up. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to strengthen you. I will be here so you may continue to live your life. And I think that's what the connecting of the dots is. Not just our three people tonight, but all of the people over four years, and all of you who are brought here for a personal reason. Many of you, year after year, there are familiar faces to our, our uh, subcommittee, the Evening of Healing, that we see. It's like, oh, good to see you, good to see you. We see you in April. And that's OK. <laughs> But the community is here, we care, and we're finding our compassion. So I hope you reflect on that and connect the dots this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. I, I slipped up in the, in the program, and now we're going to listen to Lauren again. Thank you so much, Lauren, for being here. She's a Plattsburgh State student and has, has played at other significant occasions, so we appreciate that. So we'll listen to Lauren, and then if you have any questions, uh, there will be people to pick them up if you'd rather hand them in, or we're going to just open it up to questions and comments after that. Thank you all. Don't go changing to try to please me. You never let me down before. Mm -hmm. I don't imagine you're too familiar, and I don't. Never want to work that hard. Mm -hmm. 